Welcome to another episode of Mind Matters, the talk program that provokes critical thinking, logic, and reason. We encourage all of our listeners to use their common sense in all of their decision making, especially if it involves an issue that you think is important or one that affects your liberties and God-given rights. Episode of Mind Matters. Um, good to see you, man. Hey, John. Good to see you too. Well, yeah, and uh, anyhow, and I, and I want to thank the viewers and the listeners for coming back as well. We have a a, a good program today. A good conversation going to take place. Um, something we need to consider and think about. I, I got to say though that it's been one wild and wooly conspiracy dream world that's being played out there these days, especially with the recent train derailments in the chicken farms and turkey farms and food processing centers that have burned and it's something we need to look at and, I, and i'll just you know I'll, I'll brief on what i'm talking about i'm sure people have um paid attention it wasn't long ago um that the basra egg farm burned down hundred thousand chickens were killed um devastating to the people that worked there. There were no injuries, just the chickens. And then uh, even back to last year in May, there was a chicken farm, Forsman Farms in Minnesota, where tens of thousands of chickens were roasted before their time. And again, there were no fatalities. Nobody got hurt. I think there might have been a couple of injured uh, fire personnel, but everybody was safe except for those chickens. And then there's, you know, there's been fires in Iowa and in the Midwest. There's been turkey farms and all kinds of plants that have burned down, and it's it's, it's eye opening. And then if we flip to the train pains, you know, the derailments, and um, our hearts go out to anybody that was injured in those communities that were uh, smoked out and have toxic fumes. This conversation is in no way meant to make fun or or denigrate in a negative way. Um, But on the 2nd of February, or actually the 3rd of February, there was a a major derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. Some 30 cars of the Norfolk Southern Railroad line um, were derailed and piled up. That's the picture behind me right here. And just toxic fumes, toxic smoke, fires, and it was devastating. And then not, but 10 days later, there was a derailment in Ennery, South Carolina on the 13th of February. Uh, There was another derailment on the same day, surprisingly in Splendora, Texas. Um, And we've been, we've been reading about these and watching them in the news. And uh, there was a four alarm fire, uh, which is a bad fire. A huge lumber yard burned down in Williamsburg, New York. That was on the 21st of this month. Uh, and on the same day, too, there was a huge explosion of the welding and aluminum storage facility in Medley, Florida, which is northwest of Miami down in Dade County. And two people were killed. And I want you to comment on this. Dan. You know, on face, my gosh, it looks like our food production is mm-hmm. under attack to, to create a shortage and raise prices. It looks like our train transportation system that carries freight and cargo all over the country is 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 under attack. You know, we, we don't want to be conspiracy theorists here, but it's something to be concerned about for sure, because people are injured, stuff's damaged, uh, there's deaths, there's toxic fumes, all kinds of things we just discussed. Um, but when you start looking at the data, and I know, Dan, that you're huge on data, you and your engineering mind, um, when I go to transport the Department of Transportation data on train derailments, it, it, it's it's kind of it's eye opening. Uh, it's been reported that between 1990 and 2021, so a couple of decades of data collection, that there was an average of 1,100. I'm sorry, 1,705 train derailments a year. 
Of course, none of them have been as catastrophic as the ones we've seen recently. Uh, most of those derailments have minor damage and there's no injury or death. They're cleaned up rather quickly and uh, the, the cars are back on the tracks in short order. Now the fires. Fires is another thing that we looked at. So I, I went to the National Fire Protection Association, also called the NFPA. And for a shorter period of time, 2015, 2019, uh, these numbers of fires took place. Uh, manufacturing and processing facilities for food, there were 5,308 fires that took place. And refrigerated food storage centers around the country during that time period, there were 35 fires. Uh, agricultural related uh, food accidents with fires, 961. And grain that burned or a livestock storage facility that burned, there was 1,155 fires reported. So between that four-year period of time, you had, what's that, 6,000, 75, 8,000 fires reported. Um, but of course, the ones that we see are the big, huge ones, the devastating ones. And what I've witnessed on Twitter and on some of the other social media is that everybody um, is up in arms in this great speculation, like I just mentioned, that some ominous force or power or group of people or nations or something are trying to destroy our food supply and transportation system. I'm not sure if that's the case. <laughs> so, well, well, as a critical thinker myself, uh, the first thought that crosses my mind is Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. crossed my mind too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's the first thing that comes into mind. We have such, an incompetent and incapable uh, leader of our infrastructure system. And by the way, food production and delivery is part of our infrastructure. And, uh, uh, you know, as an engineer, first of all, derailments are not, derailments are, I, I know they're a common uh, occurrence, but what made uh, New Palestine unusual is just look at the cars. How did they get into that situation where they're all piled on top of one another? And, uh, you know, most derailments I've seen is the train stops pretty quickly because you're trying to you're trying to push uh, uh, train cars through the mud. But in any event, it did happen. And I, I sure as an engineer question, I, I, I'm sure a lot of thought went into this, but I'd sure like to see the analysis, the thinking behind the idea to set all of this on fire. It, does that mean that every tanker in the entire train was punctured and leaking? I don't think so. I would think that there would be maybe two or three you might find, but I may be entirely wrong. Uh, Knowing a little bit about groundwater hydrology uh, as an engineer, uh, I know that uh, the chemicals that were there are he some of them are heavier than water, which means they will penetrate uh, the uh, groundwater table and remain in the uh, in the boundary between the bottom of the groundwater table and bedrock, which I think, from my recollection. In uh, in Ohio is about 120 feet down, and they will remain there. Those chemicals will remain there forever. <laughs> they you can't get them out. So this is a even before the fire. This is a major, major environmental catastrophe that is just being downplayed by the people involved and. Again, I'd like to see the decision making that went behind uh, setting this on fire. I, I, it just, <laughs> it seems like somebody thought that if they lit a match, it would all just go away. But but I'm afraid that they made the problems much worse. Yeah, and doesn't that always seem to be the case in, in, in 
and some things that the government gets involved in, especially catastrophes. Uh, there's there's always a lot of finger pointing. You know, I, I saw the other day where they were blaming President Trump for some kind of breaking law that was passed for trains. So the level of or or the level of blame, but the lack of taking responsibility in this day and age is just mind boggling. When I was brought along, if you made a mistake, we, we all make mistakes. Own up to it. Don't blame anybody else. And just take responsibility. Now, of course, that was on a smaller scale. And then something as catastroph catastrophic as this train derail, I would imagine that before we go pointing the finger at anybody and blaming anybody, we need to conduct these investigations to find out what actually happened, who's responsible, and if there are some uh, uh, parties that were negligent, then they need to be brought to justice. That's a whole other story. Where is justice? No, I, but, you know, we're supposed to be critical thinkers. What, what's the first step of critical thinking is collect the information. And as citizens, we don't have access to the information. If you looked online and wanted to see the engineer report that said that we should light those uh, that train on fire uh, we don't have access to it we can't gain it so you are a proponent of i am a proponent of critical thinking but the people that enable critical thinking to take place are presenting roadblocks and to me that's a real serious situation this freedom of information bullshit that we've got to go through all the time uh, is just to get information that should be held and should be accessible to us. All of these classified documents, I have a feeling that if Washington just wants to cover their ass, where it used to say, you used to say CYA, it, they, they'll put on classified instead. Things are being classified that shouldn't be classified. And the American people are being starved for information. And let me let me just relate one more thing to those that think such things could never happen. Uh, Stalin and Lenin in the 20s, uh, when they were, they'd taken the land from the kulaks, the farmers, the landowners, and given it to the people, The uh, a famine broke out, which you would expect. But if you look at the history, Stalin and Lenin uh, did things to accentuate the famine. They did things to make it worse, and then they could blame the famine on the capitalists or the people that were resisting uh, giving their land up. So famine as a tool for government is, uh, is wow, it's, John, it's just 100 years old. So yeah. don't think that these things, you know, that they couldn't happen, because if you disrupt the food supply of a nation, you certainly have a lever in trying to uh, maybe put forth some ideological thoughts. And just as critical thinkers in your audience, just keep that in mind. Put that as a little piece of information that I'll store and remember. Yeah, that's a great point, Dan. I'll take it a step further with Stalin and Lenin did. Anybody that questioned what was going on by the government or questioned the censorship or questioned uh, the cover-ups were deemed intellectuals, people that, you know, that, that use critical thought, logic and reason to make a determination based on the information that they had. Most of those people were shipped off to gulags, re-education camps, and a lot of them didn't return. So it didn't just happen in Russia. I think Mao did the same thing in China. They had another great famine there, uh, which killed millions of people. And anybody that questioned it or rose up against the government we're also, um, you hate to use the word liquidated, but re-educated and uh, subsequently disappeared as well. So you're right, Dan. Famine has been used as a tool. And then, and fear. And right now, what I'm witnessing and people that I talk to, there's a lot of fear out there these days. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and a lot of it's, yeah, a lot of it's justified. But uh, unjustified fear is something we have to be very cautious about.
So, and I, and I totally be, uh, one of my drill sergeants used to say, stay alert, stay alive. You know, you're a soldier, keep an eye on the things around you, be observant, read between the lines. Not everything that's sensational is, is the truth sometimes. And we've seen that in the media, how a story comes out. It's like, the, it's like the, the flavor of the day. People are going nuts. Both sides are pointing fingers at each other. And then a few days later, it's another bling bling story. And we're off to something else. Um, again, it's important to to be aware of what's going on and probably realize that we're not getting all the information. But we need, as a free nation, <laughs> free nation, we need to be we need to hold those who are in power and the elected officials who work for us. We need to hold them accountable. And how do we do that when a lot of people feel right now like they're powerless because they're not getting the information? How do we do that? Keep well, yeah, that's down. a good question. How do you? How does? How does uh, uh, the border to the United States remain open the way it is? That's a violation of law. It's a. I mean, it can be shown on the books that every person that's crossing that border is violating the law. So, therefore, aren't the police or the authority, the border authority is supposed to do something to prevent that from happening, and why not? So we talk about accountability, but it's just, it, it's a fart in a windstorm. I hate to I hate to be so crude, but that's, I'm afraid that's what it is. And, and unless, I think the question, the statement needs to be, unless we start holding our leaders accountable, nothing will change. I, I couldn't agree with you more. So there you have it. You know, interesting conversation today. Uh, censorship, sensationalism, uh, cover-ups, responsibility, accountability, leadership, um, and freedom. And where do the, all those stand and how do they get integrated into our day-to-day -day life? Um, I just want to thank you, Dan, for being here again on another conversational thought provocation uh, episode. And I want to thank the listeners out there for tuning in again to listen to Dan and me um, make some interesting points. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, John. And use your mind because it matters. Thank you for listening to another episode of Mind Matters. Remember, your mind matters, but only if you use it. Stay alert. Stay alive. Keep your eyes wide open.